So welcome everybody to this research seminar with uh, Victoria Spicer and Nicole Nisbet. Climate crisis norm entrepreneurs, how successful are they? So Victoria is uh, associate professor at the University of Leeds School of Politics and National Studies. Uh, did her PhD in Bielefeld, Germany, but most importantly, she used to be a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute. A while ago, just before I arrived actually, <laughs> yeah. 2012 to 2014. You just left just when I arrived. At <laughs> so her interests are in uh, sustainability research and uh, specifically how society can make a rapid, fair and empowering transition to zero emissions, zero pollution. And Nicole Nisbet, she's a postdoctoral researcher uh, at, uh, in climate politics at the University of Leeds and has a PhD in computational social sciences you know, uh, from University of Leeds 2020 and has also worked in civil service and intergovernmental organization and uh, has similar research interests. And uh, I welcome this kind of convergence of two big interests here at the Institute, norm change and uh, climate change. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you much for the invitation and for the possibility to present our work here. So this is uh, this is research that is part of a larger research project. Um, I received funding from the UKRI Future uh, Leaders Award to do a full year, um, four plus three year project on how normative change can be accelerated in response to climate change and how it can um, then contribute to overall social change. And that's because if we want to address climate change, it's not enough just to look at what kind of technical solutions are, are out there. Um, technical solutions need a context within which they can be implemented and for that requires usually social change, social innovation, political change. And so that's what basically we try to focus on. Um, in the larger kind of you know research field at the moment, there's an increasing attention being paid to the social transformation that needs to happen if we want to respond to climate change. So there was, for instance, an important paper that came out in 2020 by Ilona Otto and her colleagues, looking at how we can stabilize um, the Earth's climate uh, through vi various um, social transformations, social tipping points. Uh, and one of the um, key kind of social systems that she identified that needs to transform that needs to happen, uh, that needs to change, is the norms and values uh, system. Because of course the norms and values define quite a lot what we see as right or wrong, what kind of behaviors are accepted in a society, what kind of institutions are accepted, what kind of laws we are implementing in a society, what kind of policies we vote for. And so they, d they, they influence many other spheres and domains um, as well. So our so the project that we are kind of working on is specifically focusing on this norms and values system and how it can change and how the, how the change can be accelerated. The change in the norms and value system is quite often driven by social movements, by um, by civil society. So in the past, if you look, uh, if you if you think about back, the abolitionist movement was quite crucial in uh, in abolishing slave slave trade and slavery. Um, the civil rights movement was quite important for, um, for, 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 for um, in, in the U.S. kind of to give um, the, the African Americans uh, rights, uh, equal rights, and um, the, the suffragists, for instance, uh, was quite important for women to receive rights to vote and to work um, and everything. So today we see a, a whole range of different protest movements around climate change that push for uh, climate change to be seen not just as an economic challenge, you know, that we need to address, but also like as a challenge because it challenges um, human rights. It, 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 it's, it's about um, people. It's about justice. It's about about fairness, um, and so we see different actors like the you know the indigenous communities, for instance, who are pushing uh, quite a lot uh, the human rights perspective on climate change. But also more recently, like youth, um, children, um, who are striking to to kind of to, to pay attention uh, to to the pr to the fact that climate change is actually going to affect them particularly strongly, and that we have a duty of care for our children and grandchildren. And of course, other climate protest movements, like for instance, Extinction Rebellion, and many others as well. So we see, we kind of focus in our research strongly on the youth uh, kind of climate activists because we think that their message is particularly potent and, and strong because they are our children and, um, and, and as such they have a very strong kind of message and it's very difficult kind of to ignore your own children like if they are kind of um, demanding justice, right? So it's, um, it, it kind of brings the climate change so much more home to people, uh, including in the global north. Um, and so in our first paper that we published uh, only recently, we kind of specifically looked into what kind of normative frames are those uh, youth climate activists pushing, um, what are they advocating for. 
and uh, and kind of how like what what the potential of this is. And following up, so we kind of establishing so these are the different kind of normative frames, like so kind of looking at into uh, climate change as a from a human rights perspective, from a duty of care perspective, but also kind of establishing an anti fossil fuel norm where basically um, we have to basically get rid of the uh, or uh, dismantle and phase out uh, the fossil fuel industry and, um, and, and rebuild basically our industry. Um, uh, looking like uh, taking into account our responsibility uh, for future generations and the most vulnerable in this world um, we also wanted to know okay so if we if they have if they kind of pushing this normative framework how successful are they actually do they have any impact do they influence you know what is happening how, how climate change is perceived how the solutions of climate change are negotiated and so that's our second paper that we're going to present here that we're going to focus on in our presentation today here is about that so do we see already some change that has been triggered and do we see a change um, starting to emerge. We specifically looked uh, into um, the kind of the discourse around the, the, the annual UNF Triple C conferences. So these are um, the, 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 the COPs, the different COPs. So like this year, we're going to have the COP27 now taking uh, place in Egypt. Last year, it was in Glasgow, the COP26. So we looked at um, over the time between COP20 in 2014 to COP26 in Glasgow and looked into how the normative discourse around, uh, or general discourse, but also the normative discourse around those COPs has changed over time. And what do we see any influence from the specific kind of normative frames that the youth uh, climate activists are pushing, whether we see them appearing more and more within this discourse uh, to kind of to see whether there is any change happening. But also we're, we're interested to know like who are actually the actors who are pushing for this change, who is who are influencing um, this, this this change that we may or may not see um, uh, around the, the annual conferences. Uh, we link that back to like um, the theory around international norms and uh, norm diffusion uh, at a global level. So um, international norms are, for instance, like human rights. These are kind of norms that are set expectations on international level with respect to what uh, kind of constitutes a desirable or reprehensible behavior. And international actors, so like countries, but also other um, you know, multinational corporations, for instance, are rewarded or punish punished if they um, adhere or violate uh, those international norms. Um, and of course, norms can change, and we've seen that, of course, happening throughout history uh, over and over again. Um, and quite often, um, this is happening um, based on three stages. So at the beginning, there's like a new norm is emerging, and at this stage, like really the norm entrepreneurs, so those who are uh, introducing new norms into this course, are quite crucial to kind of introduce new norms, to challenge the existing norms and introduce new norms. At the second stage, then uh, it's important that those uh, start start to diffuse. So where we have where we see actually change happening, so they start to replace old norms, um, and more and more actors are adopting the new normative framework. And until like a critical threshold is left uh, is kind of reached, uh, when it then kind of really cascades throughout uh, the whole kind of um, 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 well uh, arena of the of the uh, of the of the stakeholders and actors. And then at the at the last stage, it's kind of then institutionalized. So the new norms become basically um, part of a like you know the way how we how our institutions work they may become even legalized so they beca become part of a law um or international level but also at the national level so they become kind of institutionalized as such so at the moment um we're kind of focusing on the uh, quite strongly at the first and uh, at the start of the second kind of stage, so where we see the norm entrepreneurs pushing for a new norm, and also like where we hope that we can see some evidence that you know it starts to kind of diffuse that uh, that access uh, actually starts to to um, to take up this norm. Um, so as I said, um, at this stage, the norm entrepreneurs are quite important because they bring in new ideas. Um, they change the terms and nature of how we talk about a problem, how we talk about solutions, and um, at the later stage, they are quite important to make sure that actually the implementation is uh, is taken uh, properly, so that actually the actors who commit who commit to a norm are actually um, hold accountable that they indeed implemented them properly. They do so usually through like a set of different tactics. Um, information politics, symbol politics, leverage politics, and accountability politics. Information politics is like where they use, for instance, particularly in, in the context of climate change, that's quite important. They use um, scientific knowledge, like about climate change, and link that to stories and to kind of to make it more salient and more real for people um, and for for different actors. Symbol politics is like kind of where they kind of try to appeal to emotions, so it becomes not just like um, you know a, a specific kind of um, like uh, intellectual kind of discussion, but also like an emotional discussion that really kind of you know um, gets people um, 
at the heart. Leverage politics is about shaming um, actors who are uh, violating norms, kind of trying to really put pressure on them. And then accountability politics, particularly in the later stage, is quite important where they actors are held accountable uh, to the norms that they then um, commit to. Of course, they don't act within uh, like an empty space. There is usually, of course, some contestation of new norms appearing. And it's quite often um, norm entrepreneurs who kind of try to defend the status quo, who want to maintain um, the status quo, the entrenched normative status quo. So, of course, within the context of climate change, this would be fossil fuel industry, but also countries like who are depending strongly on fossil fuel extraction uh, economy, who will, of course, push strongly back um, against those new uh, changes that, um, that, uh, that, that happen in the normative uh, context. So in order to uh, measure all of this, we um, are using computational methods. So we're using Twitter primarily. So we have about 12 and a half million tweets. And these are the tweets that we use. In general, I think we had about s just over 17 million. Um, tweets across uh, 10 data sets. So these are seven COPs that Victoria mentioned from COP, uh, to, uh, COP 20 to COP 26, and then three Fridays for Future, 2018, 2019, and uh, 2021. We missed out um, the Fridays for Future in 2020 just because of the pandemic and their activity really was reduced because of the COVID um, protocols. And the Fridays for Future events are generally um, major events, the protest movements that happen throughout the year, and we just aggregated them um, annually to make it a bit uh, easier to analyze. And the COPs were taken between, um, for the two weeks across each of the um, COP um, negotiations. These usually last for about two weeks um, in either November or December each year. Uh, we collected this data through the Twitter, Twitter Academic API, which is um, a fantastic resource for, for, for researchers. And for COP, we generally had a bit of a mix of how we collected the data, either through hashtags, keywords, or official Twitter accounts, so the at UNFCCC. Um, and generally, each COP will have its own Twitter handle, so at COP26, for example, where a lot of the kind of key um, key arguments, key messages are, are pushed forward from COP. Uh, but of course, this also includes anybody who's tweeted um, around any of these topics as well. Um, and we use Twitter because it gives us this direct access to what kind of the general populace are saying. Of course, it, we know it's not representative um, and the negotiators that are actually um, uh, within the kind of COP uh, discussions aren't actually able to tweet. It's it's kind of against the laws and they don't actually have a Twitter account. So we don't get that sort of really insider information. All of these negotiations are quite closed, but we do get a lot of the public discussion and discourse around um, around COP. So we think Twitter is a, is a great resource for that. And we had slightly different methods depending on the research question that we used. For the first research question, it was about trying to understand what the normative change was and how it's permeated through the uh, public debate. So for this, we really need to analyze <coughs> all of these um, tweets to see what they were saying. We used the BERT topic, which is a transformist based uh, topic modeling approach that was released um, in the last few years. Um, and it has several stages. I won't go through it in too, too much detail, but essentially uh, it just creates embeddings of the text. Um, a dimension reduction step using UMAP, which is really important because of the large volume um, of, of data that we have. It then goes on to a hierarchical and density-based uh, clustering algorithm, which kind of um, clusters these topics, uh, these documents based on the, the similarity of the of the content and based on the embeddings. Um, then uses a bag of words approach, which is very kind of um, common approach used within natural language processing. Uh, and finally, topic representation to really give meanings to the clusters that are developed through um, the, the clustering algorithm. We also wanted to understand the semantic similarity, so how similar um, each of the data sets were to each other in terms of the, the textual content. So for this, we use, we use the Jensen-Shannon distance, which is kind of a uh, square root of the Jensen-Shannon divergence metric, which is based on the callback uh, Liebler divergence, which is, again, a quite a common... Um, a common method that's used. For the second research question, it was really about understanding who the actors were, so who are the main, the key players within these uh, discussion spaces. So for this, we use social network analysis, and we had two main data sets. We had a bipartite um, network, so that's where the nodes are either um, users, Twitter users, or normative topics that we've identified from the topic modeling process um, 
that I just described. And each of these have an edge, so that's um, a relationship between uh, the user and the topic, the normative topic that they've interacted with. And then we also had the retweet network. And this is the retweets um, of any user, regardless of the type of uh, topic that they interacted with. So this kind of gives us an understanding of the whole topic space. Now, as you can imagine, these networks are very, very large. So we um, just looked at the users with the highest between a centrality. And in this case, between a centrality, we look at users that um, have been retweeted or have, have retweeted or have been retweeted by um, many other users to kind of get the, the influence, as we call them, within that topic space. And then for the bipartite network, we look at page rank. So these are the nodes um, with the high page rank, generally frequently retweeted by um, other users and then more central to the COP uh, debate specifically around these normative discussions. So I'll we'll show uh, in a little while kind of how these uh, different measures kind of interact to really give us an understanding and a good picture of what was we were talking about. So in terms of the topic representation, if we kind of go back to the, the first question, how are these um, norms kind of permeating through the discussion space? So this um, each of these represents one of the COPs and it's a uh, kind of representation of the hierarchical clustering that I mentioned that's within the BERT topic um, algorithm. So each of these kind of uh, circles are different topic spaces and the red ones are highlighted, uh, the normative topics. So these could be um, to do with future generations, human rights, um, small island states. And we can see kind of how they develop over time and the proportion within the actual general topic space as well. Uh, we're going to go through this in a little bit more detail to kind of explain what's going on and how um, it's actually um, evolved. So the COP21, um, uh, the COP20, which was in 2014, in Lima, in Peru, the thing that this is kind of the, the, the COP that's really set in uh, set in set the stage for COP twenty one uh, Paris Agreement, because um, the normative discourse was quite strong actually around COP twenty, and it was pushed a lot by the indigenous communities back then. So it was in Peru, the indigenous community played a huge role through protests, through demands, um, in kind of bringing the human rights really. Um, perspective on climate change quite strongly into the COP negotiations, demanding fa specifically fossil fuel phase out. So at this stage, we have a, a very strong kind of anti-fossil fuel norm that is pushed by other actors, by indigenous communities, and this kind of human rights perspective. And I think this COP was quite important to for COP21 to happen with the Paris Agreement. So COP21 is the kind of notorious Paris Agreement, very historic. Um, many countries kind of committed to, to, to really limiting fossil fuels and to be accountable for that. Um, so naturally it was dominated by this large um, Paris Agreement uh, cluster here. We do have some normative topics still emerging. Uh, these are more central and more kind of um, substantive topics, so ones around future generations. Again, the fossil fuel problem is, is still um, relevant and the indigenous communities. We also have a subtopic about um, the International Space Station, which is here about the astronauts on the International Space Station kind of coming together and really understanding the, the planetary, um, uh, the importance of maintaining the pal planetary um, ecosystem um, for future generations as well. So although the percentage of normative topics was actually the smallest in all of our data set, it was only about uh, 4%, um, the types of things that they were talking about within these normative topics were still very important. And we'll see these kind of emerge throughout, um, throughout the COP discussions. After COP twenty one, um, actually in the in the next two COPs, we'll really see a decrease in in the, in the focus on normative topics. So, um, the focus becomes very strongly on kind of negotiation the, the details of the Paris Agreement, kind of fleshing it out. It becomes very technical, like very kind of focused on technical sphere, uh, themes and and topics. And the um, the perspective and the focus on the human rights uh, on justice becomes actually quite small and becomes quite. Uh, unimportant in a way so we see a decrease in kind of the um, the perspective on on on, on the normative um, frames cop 23 was held in um what the presidency was fiji but it was held held in bonn so we have a large topic um, around the um, small island developing states which is the sids uh, just here again fossil fuel problems you'll see that keeps coming up um, throughout all of these cops but of course indigenous communities and future generations is still is still very important but as uh, victoria mentioned this is still the legacy of the cop uh, 21 paris agreement is still there so a lot of the topics are more focused around those um, that paris agreement and really trying to implement it and and push forward uh, the the commitments that were made there. 
So COP24 is then when kind of the, the youth climate strike has really entered the stage, right? So that's like when Fridays for Future started with their first protests and Greta Thunberg has been invited to COP24 to give her first speech um, on the international um, context and really see how this kind of invigorated kind of the whole normative frameworks around COP. So we see an increase in normative topics, an increase of, uh, of attention given to normative topics. So. Um, of course, you know, like the Fridays for Future themselves, um, uh, but also, like, you know, how it has been taken up then by other actors as well. So, for instance, David Attenborough, who uh, who kind of was representing the, the people's seat at, at the COP24, um, was, in, was in his kind of presentation of the kind of the people's voices, was ac actually like referencing many children, like, you know, and voicing their concerns, their fears, like, you know, for their, for their future. But also parents, like, you know, very strongly kind of, you know, parents kind of being like, having seen, like, you know, their children protesting, you know, how that affected them and how kind of they um, were expressing their concerns for like for their children. And that was kind of then becoming a very strong kind of topic and very strong theme around COM24. Uh, now, COP25 is where we really see kind of the Fridays for Future movement really kind of come into its own. That was the year where they had multiple global strikes um, and it really became kind of a, a household name in that way. So within COP25, uh, a quarter of all of the topics had some sort of normative um, a value attached to them, which is the highest that we've seen uh, so far. So, of course, we have Greta Thunberg's speech, which was kind of um, a major, a major key point within the within the COP. Um, but the Fridays for Future, they also link a lot with the indigenous communities. And we'll see a little bit later on how how there's a quite a big overlap between those. And we see this within the, the topic space. So indigenous communities and future generations and children are really um, important. Again, the fossil fuel problem is still there in terms of how we can kind of reduce um, our dependence on fossil fuels. Uh, loss and damage um, and people who have been excluded generally from um, the topic space uh, and from general climate negotiations are being raised as well. Um, but as uh, Victoria mentioned before, as with the norm entrepreneurs, you'll ha also have the norm entrepreneurs. So Greta Thunberg comments are kind of some people who are a bit more skeptical, um, criticizing the actual Fridays for Future movement. So we still s we're seeing um, as the Fridays for Future kind of increases and the normative values are permeating through the discussion space, we also see the entrepreneurs who are kind of trying to fight against that and maintain the status quo. So after the peak at COP24, where we see really the peak of normative kind of, of, of attention given to justice um, uh, topics and uh, normative topics, COP26 uh, COP was a delayed COP because in 2020 there was no COP because of the pandemic, so it was a delayed one. And there actually um, we see that the, for instance, like you know, Fridays for Future actors like Greta Thunberg have not even been invited to the COP26 to give a talk. So their visibility has actually diminished um, at COP26. However, the message was still quite strong and particularly because it was carried on by other actors. So for instance, David Attenborough again kind of quite strongly referenced like their messages, their kind of normative frames in his speech. But also um, indigenous communities were kind of strongly kind of collaborating with, uh, with, the, with the youth strikers and kind of trying to kind of merge their, their message together and kind of trying to kind of have a united kind of message um, about uh, the normative frames and, and, and the justice aspects of, 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 fr um, of climate change. And we see still kind of this strong kind of you know, emphasis on, um, on kind of the anti-fossil fuel norms in, in, in this cluster as well. So we've had a look and kind of understood a little bit more about the types of normative uh, discussions that were happening throughout these COPs. Um, we also wanted to understand how similar these COPs were to each other and to the Fridays for Future discussions. So this um, shows the the semantic discourse and sim similarity based on that Jen Jensen-Shannon distance that I mentioned earlier. So the smaller distances, uh, the closer together and the more similar each of these um, data sets are. Um, and we see generally uh, a kind of the discussion becoming more and more similar as um, the cops kind of go on. Specifically um, with the Fridays for Future, we see COP21, which was the key um, Paris Agreement, where a lot of these kind of norms in terms of protection for future generations, uh, human rights, um, which kind of was the basis of a lot of these um, uh, um, agreements that, 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 that were made during that COP are kind of much more similar to the Fridays for Future discussions than any of the others. So we can see kind of uh, how COP21 really was much more similar, uh, semantically similar, similar to the Fridays for Future discussion. And then um, 
as the discussion kind of went away specifically from the reasons for the um, for the for the agreement and more of the technicalities on actually how we're going to achieve this agreement, it becomes again a little bit more dissimilar um, as we go along until we get to COP25 and COP26, where um, where the Fridays for Future kind of ethos and their presence was a lot more prevalent uh, within these discussions. So we do see generally. Um, the goals of the Fridays for Future and the kind of things that they're trying to push forward are actually becoming more and more prevalent within the general public discussion around COP26, which is which is uh, kind of really positive for us. We kind of tried to... Yeah, so... Oh, sorry. Uh, hold on a minute. There we go. So uh, this is, yeah, so each of the COPs and each of the Fridays for Future. So the larger distances are meaning that the um, discussions are more s semantically different, whereas the smaller ones, so for example, um, here, COP22 and COP23, were very sim similar to, sim s smaller number is more similar. Yeah, because this is the distance measure. Is that okay? <laughs> So we kind of then try to zoom in, like, you know, what actually does this uh, similarity mean, like, specifically, right, in terms of like, what kind of normative frames are used uh, in the different discourses, like, where do we see the similarity? So if we, for instance, compare the COP26 and the Fridays for Future 2021, so, like, it's the same year, we can see similarities on one hand, like, you know, with respect to the anti-fossil fuel norms, so that becomes quite strong within the COP kind of discourse, and is, of course, quite strongly pushed by the Fridays for Future um, uh, movement. Then the other uh, similarity is kind of this focus on this duty of care for, for future generations and uh, for vulnerable uh, people in general. Um, kind of this solidarity between the youth and they see like, you know, in the, in the same way how you don't care about poor, you don't care about as a children, you know, because, you know, and you disregard our, you know, our well-being uh, as much as you disregard the well-being of the, um, you know, of the people who are already now suffering from climate change. So this is kind of, in a way, like a strong solidarity between uh, the youth and, you know, the, the, um, the global South actors kind of both kind of um, trying to appeal to this duty of care um, from politicians. The strong human rights perspective is also kind of you know something that we see like is similar is similar between those discourses. Where there is a strong dissimilarity, and of course there is dissimilarity as well, is that um, Fridays for Future actually becomes quite system critical um, towards the end. Like so, they, when they started, they were quite still. They were strongly kind of pushing for kind of climate change uh, being taken serious and kind of you know and the duty of care. But actually, the more they move um, later, like they become more and more system critical, so they become very critical of capitalism, very critical of kind of the whole decolonization history of how it kind of contributed to the climate change, and we don't see that at all, uh, or not so much, or to much much a lesser degree in COP. So there is, of course, the similarity as well. So where we, s where we see similarities uh, in some of the normative frames, we also see that some of the normative frames d do quite um, are quite distinct as well. So. Now we're moving to the second uh, research question. Sorry, there we go. Uh, second research question, and uh, this is trying to understand who the actors are within this discussion. Now I have to apologise for the kind of display. It's um, not as clear as we'd like it. Um, we do have a paper that we've uh, a preprint where you can see it a li little bit more clearer. So um, apologies for that. But these are kind of representations of how the actual normative discussion, how people are actually interacting within this. So I'll just explain a little bit about what we can see. So the each of the nodes are either topics or users, so normative topics or users. Um, the green edges are ones that have people are interacting with a particular topic. So you can see most of these are um, users interacting with the topic. The orange nodes here are where influencers, so these are the ones that have the highest between a centrality that have been retweeted the most among the general um, retweet space of the, of the public discussion, how much they are actually within this normative discussion as well. Uh, to see, you know, these influences in the large discussion, are they actually engaging with the normative topics, or are they just engaging with the kind of general, um, general COP issues? Um, so we're going to go through these again in a little bit more detail um, and hopefully explain <laughs> explain what's going on here. Yeah, so they're supposed to be actually um, purple, but because I think s somehow, like you know, because we we made the presentations in Mac, and because they're now shown in Windows, it's all just screwed up. But <laughs> sorry about that. Anyway, so. 
Um, so this is kind of the, the the network for COP20. So that's like you know, the, the the kind of in Peru in 2014, just before the Paris Agreement. Um, and we see you know that the influential influential actors are quite embedded, are quite central within the overall network. So there is quite a, f a lot of interactions between the influencers and the normative topics. We kind of here like have like just a set of uh, influencers, like the most the biggest ones who are who have kind of pushed for those normative topics. And we see it, it's quite often you know like you know activists, um, campaigners, NGOs who are really kind of pushing those normative uh, discourses within o the overall kind of uh, climate change um, discourse around the COPs. It's not so much the, the ones who are the more kind of official kind of um, uh, accounts like, you know, Lima COP20 or uh, Christina Figueres from the UNF C president. Um, although some, um, some similarities are, for instance, Colin Rees, which is an environmental con campaigner. He's one of the like high, highest page rank kind of uses. He's also one of the influencers who really is quite strongly interacted with the, with the kind of uh, key uh, normative topics. So for COP21, we um, see a larger kind of proportion of these influencers, but they are more jutted out. They're not really interacting as much um, with um, the normative topics that we have here. So the main topics, of course, f future generations, fossil fuel problem. These are normative topics. So the kind of general kind of uh, Paris Agreement discussion wasn't wasn't in this um, network. Um, down here we have the International Space Station. So they that was a normative topic because they were talking about kind of planetary uh, protection for pla protection of the planet for future generations as well. Um, but they are a lot more distinct to the rest of the um, general uh, normative discussions. So users with the highest page rank here are the UNFCCC, COP21, the UN accounts, um, as is sort of to be expected. Um, the proportion of influencers, so these are ones within the general uh, topic space that are, are kind of the most um, ones with the highest between us centrality, um, are generally interacting with the future generations, the, f the f fossil fuel problem and the indigenous topics as well. But as I said, they are kind of um, separated. They're not essential as they were, for example, within the COP20, uh, COP20 space. And generally, the most um, uh, the users who are interacting the most with some of these topics are Nili Majumdar, who is a um, global um, gender gender rights advocate, um, some of the environmental networks, um, but also you have a lot of kind of citizen and um, and uh, kind of civil society um, actors who are actually interacting primarily with some of these normative topics here. So are the black spots, what are they? So those, uh, these are supposed to be in purple, uh, but these are just regular users, so just general Twitter users who are interacting with each of these um, each of these topics. So COP22, um, as I said, after COP21, uh, when we kind of talk about the normative topics, I mean, this is when kind of the discussions become again much more, much more technical. I mean, much less focused on normative topics. So um, those topics are actually qu quite small and uh, and not so central. We still have like you know the influencers who are like generally influential within the overall discourse, who are quite integrated still within the normative kind of discourse. So they still interact with it, but overall the normative kind of um, topics become uh, less less important. Um, again, we see. Kind of similar, you know, people appearing here again, like you know, who kind of, uh, who, who kind of partly appeared before, the UN Youth and Voyages, the UNGA, which is kind of the official uh, youth delegation within uh, COP, um, the UNFCCC uh, kind of mechanism. But we see, like you know, again, like climate activists, different kind of NGOs who are interacting uh, with those topics and who still kind of, you know, keep it present um, uh, within the COP discourse. So within COP23, and apologies for how messy this looks, in the paper it is a lot neater, I promise. Um, there's some four main topics, and the biggest of these is the SID, so small island developing states. Uh, remember, this is the one that happened in Fiji. Oh, but the presidency was for Fiji. Um, there was quite a lot of overlap between each of these topics as well, which kind of suggests that there were users who are not just interacting with one sole topic, they're interacting with kind of a range of these different normative issues. Um, the uh, orange uh, cluster here of the um, influencers are generally interacting with the SIDS, uh, small island developing states um, topic, uh, but there is a little bit with the future generations as well. Um, which kind of shows, I mean, we see quite a lot of relation between the future generations, Fridays for Future, and the indigenous topics within the actual normative space. So it's interesting that we also see it in terms of overlaps um, within the networks as well. 
Um, generally, some of the influencers that are mainly here are the feminist um, kind of human rights and gender activists, other campaigners, uh, the large kind of official COP23 um, um, Twitter accounts as well. So it's, it's quite a, a mix of environmental, gender, um, indigenous and kind of official accounts that are, are mainly um, uh, participating within this discussion space. So COP is four, so that's like when uh, our Fridays for Future um, activists enter the stage, and you see immediately they appear as well here under the influence. See, Greta Thunberg becomes quite straight away like one of the big really influences within the discourse. So she is pushing obviously like in a long a, a lot of this um, a lot of this discourse, and is you know we, we can see like you know by the fact that she is kind of um, an influencer that she's retweeted a lot. Like, you know, a lot of people retweeting her, referencing her like you know in their in in their dis in their discussions. Um, we see as well other kind of you know um, other climate activist uh, movements like the Extinction Rebellion appearing here but we see also some we see we see, we see now also some, some politicians appearing within this discourse who some kind of take up of uh, of those discourses among politicians even though it's at this stage still just mainly from the Green Party for instance like Natalie Lieben here from the Green Party in in, in the UK still like you know we see some kind of you know um, so, so some kind of uh, appearance of those norms outside just the activists uh, kind of uh, sphere we see also some researchers like you know um, diffusing those norms as well within their or kind of uh, giving them credit uh, and, and, and credibility. So that's quite important as well for kind of the diffusion of norms. Uh, COP25, which was the main um, Fridays for Future uh, kind of when they were at their four, um, of course, it's dominated by this is Thunberg's speech. Um, that's the, the topic there. Uh, so dominated um, by this topic. And you can see a lot of links. So this means there are a lot of users who are interacting with uh, Thunberg's speech and all of the other normative topics uh, down here. Um, the main kind of um, users within this discussion space were generally kind of official accounts, um, fan a Spanish ministry, ministry for Ecological Transition, for example. Um, but the influencer clusters are generally linked to the Friday, uh, fossil fuel problem and the UN General Secretary speech as well. And you have a lot of, I mean, you can't see them so well, but these kind of little pockets of um, of users here are actually kind of uh, ones that are interacting, for example, both with Thunberg's speech and of future generations, or with um, kind of uh, the f uh, fossil fuel problem and Thunberg's speech. So you can see kind of clusters of users who have an intent interest in kind of more than one um, uh, normative topic space. Um, Generally, the influential users down here are kind of, it's hard to see here, but they're a little bit split. So you have some who are not really interacting with any of the, too much with the actual normative topics. And you have others who are kind of more centralized here, who are really interacting with um, a lot of the f um, Thunberg speech, for example, the fossil fuel problem, future generations. And a lot of these ones, for example, Greta Thunberg's account is kind of somewhere hidden within these orange orange nodes over here. But you also have a lot of parents for future, for example, which is kind of the, the kind of offshoot of, of, of Fridays for Future. You have climate change ambassadors. You have Colin Rees, again, who is a, a climate activist who appears quite regularly throughout um, the different COPs. So you see a really nice mix of people from uh, Global North and Global South. For example, you have Vanessa Nakate um, from Uganda, who's also within this kind of orange um, topic space, who are actually retweeting a lot of these um, normative topics and kind of spreading it without their net throughout their networks as well. It's a little slow. <laughs> yeah, so COP26, that's the last one that we kind of explored. Um, as, as, as we remember, you know, like the, the, the kind of the, the, the focus on normative uh, topics has a, a little bit decreased in COP26 comparing to kind of COP25. We still have, however, um, you know, those messages that quite strongly pushed by Fridays for Future, but also other climate activists appearing and being diffused by different, um, by different actors. Um, 
we kind of have also, so in, with our paper where we uploaded, we have also a whole kind of um, data set uh, where we have for each kind of influencer, like how with which topic they interacted and how often. So though they might not appear here, we actually see now more and more politicians um, or political actors and official negotiators starting to, to kind of to interact with normative topic, not like as often as like, of course, the activists, but they start to take it up, which is like a show that it starts to permeate within like, you know, um, official kind of um, negotiators and also politicians like, you know, um, like Alok Sharma, who was the uh, COP26 president. He, for instance, kind of treated some of the, retreated some of the kind of future generations kind of messages, normative uh, messages and so on. So we see that kind of in the more detailed kind of description of the data set. Okay, we'll just wrap up, so. <laughs> yeah, so just to wrap up, we've shown you kind of a lot of data and a lot of images here. Um, if we go back to our research question, the first one we wanted to look at is a what extent has a normative discourse um, permeated in the global discussion around um, climate change conference? So we do see actually a clear evidence of norm permeation as we see some years, is some years are more um, uh, evident than others. For example, um, COP25, COP26, COP24 are very prevalent. COP21 is a little bit smaller. Um, we see particularly the ones around duty for care um, for the most vulnerable, responsibility to prevent harming, uh, human rights. These things are really, um, really, really important. And these are the norms that are being pushed the most, especially at COP25 um, and then again a little bit at COP26. We also see a lot of anti-fossil fuel norms um, being pushed forward with the, with the FF problem topic. Um, this happened in pretty much every COP and it was increasing. And this was a lot linked to the duty of care norm. So we saw a lot of people who were interacting with the fossil fuel problem, also interacting with future generations or human rights topics. Um, there were a lot of rain, uh, norm diffusion tactics, for example, information politics, um, with a lot of um, scientific evidence being pushed forward, leverage politics specifically within uh, the Fridays for Future holding um, the um, the kind of fossil fuel companies shaming them for for kind of neglecting their duty of care to the future generations and to indigenous communities and accountability politics really holding people to account uh, to account specifically um, at COP26 as well with uh, with which was the first year of the um, nationally defined contributions uh, where countries really had to kind of report what they had done since the the, the Paris Agreement in in COP21. And we see the first signs of uh, these norms being resonated with negotiators and high level decision makers. Now, of course, we mentioned before that the negotiators aren't actually tweeting, so we can't see it from that side. But the fact that the, a lot of politicians are interacting a lot more with some of these normative topics, specifically within COP26, even though the Fridays for Future um, kind of official representatives like Greta and Vanessa were not um, actually present at COP26 so much, we still see their norms being kind of diffused throughout these key decision makers. And we've seen from anecdotal evidence with people who have actually interacted with some of the negotiators at the COPs that these messages and these norms are actually being um, kind of understood and valued by some of these negotiators as well. Yeah, so we see that you know those who are kind of pushing those um, activists, um, th those kind of normative t t uh, normative um, agendas, are of course activists, campaigners, NGOs. I think the important here is that the youth climate activists, when they kind of joined their ranks and kind of entered the, f the space, they quite strongly, kind of uh, quite quickly, kind of built alliances with the different kind of NGOs, with different other kind of you know normative actors uh, in the sphere, to kind of to try to multiply their voices, kind of to try to reunite uh, in their messages, and they were also like you know quite successful in recruiting some of the norm champions. Um, who could kind of further diffuse their norms. Uh, so like, you know, David Atomer being like one of the really kind of most influential probably like, you know, who kind of was very successful in kind of spreading further their, 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 um, their, the messages, but also others like, you know, policymakers, but also journalists, uh, researchers, you know, for instance, are, are quite important norm diffusers as well. Um, we see that generally kind of, you know, uh, at, at those COPs where the different actors reunited, kind of where they kind of joined forces and kind of tried to work together um, to kind of to push their message, that's when they were most successful in kind of where the messages resonated most, uh, you know, across COP with different kind of actors. So. Um, 
that's where it really they were most powerful. Um, to follow up on this, so we um, kind of briefly kind of mentioned you know, that what we see in our research is also kind of the evidence that once, like you know, there is a, an increase in kind of the normative debate around COPs, we also see immediately also kind of the reappearance or the strengthening of denial and uh, and delay discourses around COP as well. So there's immediately a pushback. So whenever like you know like there's a strong kind of push from the normative side and um, there is a push again from the anti-norm entrepreneur. So our next paper will actually focus on that dynamic, like how those different um, normative debates and like the, the kind of the, the, the new norms and the established norms, how they are kind of uh, in conflict with each other and you know who like to whom like the, res the, the decision makers specifically how do they respond to those different kind of normative uh, arguments you know that pushed forward by the different actors which are resonating with them but also with the general public uh, general public so we have already started like doing lots of interviews with politicians kind of to try to understand this but we also look at other data that we're going to uh, look specifically as well in this case and of course like what we're also more generally kind of interested within this um, overall kind of research project is kind of how can we um, how can we reinforce those dynamics how can we amplify them and how can we um, can, uh, how can we kind of um, accelerate the change that uh, that we see starting to happen? Um, and there is some interesting research going on at the moment. For instance, like you no know, seeding. Um, tipping points within social networks, kind of trying to target specific kind of uh, specific uh, influences users, kind of to try to make the diffusion um, in a way faster and, uh, and more efficient. Um, so there's a lot of research um, starting to happen in this field uh, to which we also are connected with our research um, overall. And if you want to know more about this paper, so there's a, we kind of put a working paper on this research on our homepage for, the, for our project, but there's also other papers that we have been uh, publishing other output that you may want to have a look at. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sure there are going to be many questions uh, since we are a mixed crowd, both online and here. Um, just remind people that um, if you wish to ask a question, uh, if you're online, you should write it in the chat. And we use this uh, hand finger or hand as a new question finger as a follow up. And as we are a mix of researchers, Please also state which field you are in, so we can mix questions from different disciplines. And uh, the first half hour will be recorded. So let's see, what do we have as the first question, apart from me? Okay, then it will be me, I think. I didn't see any. Oh, there it was. Christy, you go first. <laughs> okay. Yes, hello. So my name is Kirsti Ulyhan. I'm a researcher in psychology. And I really enjoyed this presentation, really impressive work. Uh, so very interesting. So. Um, one question that I was thinking quite a lot throughout is how did you define how you define normative? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think I have some follow-up questions about this, but maybe you want to answer this. Yeah, we use kind of the moral foundation theory a little bit kind of to try to identify what is what is more uh, what is normative. So whenever there is a topic about like you know for instance harm, for instance like you know how fossil fuels are harming like certain people, like you know that would like, be classified as normative because it's about like you know the harm kind of um, the harm care kind of moral foundation. If there's about justice, like you know the inequality, um, like you know the and of course it kind of uh, it kind of um, answers to this kind of fairness um, aspect of, of moral foundation theory. So we kind of try to use this kind of to to establish what what are the normative kind of topics within our um, our data, right? Because I was thinking that you had some words there that you didn't include, for example, gender mm -hmm. uh, crisis, which also is a, some don't agree that there is a crisis. They want to use some other word, for example, and and so on. And um, we have a paper with Julia Mosquera from here uh, that is coming out soon, where we discuss the normativization of emotions, where even if you feel anxiety or not, could also kind of be discussed in terms of what is the norm of how to feel and so on. And um, so kind of like this is something that I was wondering if you saw in your data that that would you consider including these as norms? And also one more question about this and then I'm done. <laughs> um, because you said that the care norm and questions of injustice were commonly uh, discussed there. Did you see any kind of, let's say, more conser conservative norms? Uh, showing up in discussions also. Yeah, so um, I mean, conservative norms like are usually appearing on the other side. Um, so like for kind of maintaining the normative uh, status quo. So like you know, kind of because of it's it's of course a lot about kind of 
well keeping the order right like as it is um kind of the the, the authorities as they are kind of the global power structures as there are right so in a way like you know those other moral norms which are of course also moral in a way appear more on on the other side of the debate so we kind of didn't look at them as, as such because I mean we are looking at the new norms kind of the, 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 the that is challenging those kind of established norms so that's why they don't appear in although of course they have still kind of some moral in a way like some f moral arguments in them included right um, I mean yes because so. yeah. I was thinking like if the the advice for climate uh, communication would be to appeal to conservative norms mm. to kind of promote climate action but you didn't see any of these emerging where people actually appeal to these conservative norms no so i mean the research is showing that y one can uh, to some extent kind of try like to um to to get the conservatives on board by kind of trying to 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 kind of engineer the, the messages in a way that is also appealing to them though it seems like you know that i mean from the research that i know um usually it still will reference the fairness and the the duty of care kind of it's just that it will kind of link them maybe like things like to traditional family values or something like that rather than um but it still would kind of appeal to this to those kind of foundations rather than um authority or in group loyalty though i mean i mean this is something that we want to explore actually in another research anyway and uh, we actually talked with pontus about it how like you know we are interested in this as well so but it's within this kind of research we didn't focus on it because we didn't see any um any of the conservative um debates that were that w that would have been kind of supportive of the new norms that I that are pushed by the climate activists and that's what we were interested in right like you know the the type of, the type of normative frames that are pushed by the by the uh, youth climate activists and they don't really use at the moment they don't really use any conservative appealing moral arguments very interesting thank you so much <laughs> thank you so i have a follow-up we have two follow-ups because I wonder, you, you sp spoke about the duty of care, and I just wonder what that means. Does it mean anything more than just that you have to take into account the interest uh, if you have a duty of care? Or so did you I mean, more on political philosophy that has a very specific yeah. connotation of a very specific kind of morality. So duty of care comes actually from the, the more of the legal side, you know, like there is, um, so um, for instance, like in, in, in Australia, there was um, there was a law that was actually pushed by the youth climate activists um, against the government because they are violating the duty of care for wow. future, for, for, the, for, the, uh, for the children. And they specifically used this kind of legal framework of duty of care to kind of appeal to the fact that the, that the government is ignoring future generations well-being or like the children's generations well-being. So when you're clustering, you're clustering a lot of different of statements under the duty of care. Yes, it doesn't need to be duty of care ex explicitly. It's just that you, you yeah. are clustering, like if someone says we really need to you know, take the interest of future generations into account, that will end up in your study yes. under the duty of care. That's this right. More like a no, that's right. But we kind of we kind of made it more broader because uh, quite often like they would uh, they would kind of combine it with the duty of care for the vulnerable as well. So not just the future generations, but because so the the, fu the, the Fridays for Future is now quite global. So you ha they have a lot of global south uh, activists as well, like you know like Vanessa Nakata for instance. And their their argument is well, yes of course you know we have to care for future generations, but actually like you know the climate change is already real for us now. Like you know it's already now affecting people people die already now okay. in the global south so th and i think the future like the fridays for future tries to kind of unite those two kind of um in in one duty of care for the future generations but also for the vulnerable that are already affected now so that's why we kind of used this frame rather than future generations because it is not just about future generations no, that was a duty mm -hmm. of care i wonder what, yeah. what was clustering in that yes that would be mm -hmm. more or less anyone who cares about the vulnerable yeah or future generations that's right yeah. we had a follow-up also from julia Kirsty just asked the question that I was going to ask, so I'm going to ask it again <laughs> in a different way. Okay. Um, so I think you might be using the term normative topic in a different way from the way philosophers use it. Mm -hmm. So we usually use the term referring to what is right and wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're more interested in norm change, so anything that challenges a pre-existing or actual, actual existing norm. Um, so perhaps it might be helpful if you could tell us some of the non-normative topics that you saw were emerging or predominant in the discussion, but that you ruled out because you didn't think they were normative. And so I also had some um, doubts about some of the topics that you raised um, as being normative. So I was thinking in one of the slides you talk about one of the cops, you talked about art, you talked a lot about indigenous communities, and at least if they are phrased that way, 
they did not sound no. that normative to me. So yeah. I was hoping you could say a little bit more about what you thought art could count as a normative topic. Yeah. Or just in this case, because they specifically were, um, the art was all about climate justice. So that's why it was a normative topic in our case. So we look specifically at the tweets, at the kind of the type of, um, the type of, you know, frames that are appearing in those tweets. And we only kind of label them as normative if they are about right or wrong. So like climate justice is about like what is right, what is wrong, right? Like, you know, so that's why the art appeared. I mean, it is called art because it was artists who kind of tried to, you know, through art kind of communicate climate justice, but it was still about climate justice. Was not, it was not about art. It's just that how, I mean, maybe like the labeling is a bit, uh, you know, I mean, we kind of, of course, describe it in the paper, but it could be like, you know, if you just like see the short label, you don't exactly know why is it actually now normative but we we did like always kind of looked exactly at what is it what is contained in this uh, in this in this topic and there's a talk about right or wrong so there's a talk about climate justice there's a talk about human rights there's a talk about um you know um harm harm like d done through like you know uh, established kind of fossil fuel industry and only if it does talk about those themes it would appear as a normative topic so yeah so indigenous communities are very strongly arguing about human rights like you know how climate justice is all about human rights and uh, climate change is all about human rights like how it's violating their rights as, as communities so of course it is about right or wrong in that sense that's why they appear as well in our kind of um, in our clusters uh, topic classes as normative topic I hope that clarifies it a bit so what are the markers of being right wrong rights discourse do you have more markers for so as I said, we use kind of the moral foundation theory in a way kind of to try to justify. So right or wrong is like, you know, if, if you deny someone's right, that's wrong. I mean, I, I'm not a philosopher, so I would really love to learn from you, like, you know, how we can maybe better communicate that because I am not a philosopher. So we probably do quite mess it up. <laughs> so <laughs> so we're very happy to learn from you. But yeah, but so we use, <laughs> we use kind of the moral foundation theory kind of to try to establish this. So if someone's rights are violated, that's is is wrong, um, or if like if someone is harmed by by the existing practices, that's wrong because it's it's a harm that is done to them. So that's how we kind of approached it. But as I said, we're happy to learn from you, philosophers. Joe. Okay, um, great. Thank you. Um, that was super interesting. I I want to ask you a bit about like the. Um, I suppose the nature of the claim that you want to make more broadly about norm change, so, um, or whether you do, I guess. So I was wondering whether you're trying to infer a kind of broader causal relationship. The, the first research question seemed like it was framed just in terms of permeation of discourse, but the second one was about drivers. And then in some of the discussion, it seemed like you were making these more kind of causal statements, like this is the, cha this is the reason that this has changed. So I, yeah, I guess I, I'm interested in how far you think you can go with that. W one reason being just that Twitter is a kind of odd, mm. uh, closed universe. It seems obvious that there are causes for things that happen on Twitter that are not on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and you might identify things as causes within the Twitter universe, which are not like causes as such. So are you trying to infer from this about like broader reasons for or, or causal relationships between norm changes like out there in the world or are you kind of just talking about this universe of Twitter discourse? So um, we are we, we specifically say in our paper we can make any causal claims. I mean it, it is it is descriptive in a way because we of course we just look okay what do we see what kind of patterns do we see in the data and what kind of story does this data tell us right so does it tell us like you know that there is some change happening because we look at over time so in that regard, it's kind of not causal, but it, we see a dynamic in a way. Um, what exactly is causing it is very difficult, like in a, in a, in a, in a such, such complex systems, like in a socialism, it's very difficult kind of to identify without like, you know, proper, you know, uh, causal modeling or without proper kind of, you know, experimental kind of design or something. So what we can see is kind of descriptively, like, you know, in a, in a dynamic, that's what we see kind of the changes we see. We see the change like in whose acting who is kind of retweeting who is kind of you know um, uh, who's kind of what kind of topics are appearing um, of course Twitter data as well is not perfect it's the data we have available kind of to try to understand like you know what is going on like you know do we see any signs for changing change happening and because Twitter is used quite strongly as a communication tool by all stakeholders who are involved in those cops it's a quite good data source because it allows us kind of to really have this broad range of voices that are interacting with the COP and with the kind of climate change discourse around the COPs. It's not perfect. As we said, like in the France, the negotiators don't tweet, they're not 
allowed to tweet. So we don't really have access, like, you know, to their thinking or the, to their kind of reasoning. We did an interview with um, with with someone from the COP26 team, um, who was one of the senior advisor strategists, like, to the COP26 president, Alok Sharma. So we kind of tried, like, to understand. Okay, so does that, like, you know, wha what is happening here? Like, does it influence, you know, what people are talking about with behind closed doors in the negotiation negotiations rooms? And she said, yes, it does, uh, because um, negotiators, particularly the kind of the ones who kind of push for more ambitious goals, they're using those discourses to justify their and to to back up their 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 kind of their their the negotiation statements and their negotiations kind of pushes. So they are aware of it and they're using it. Um, and also, she said, you know, like you know that Alok Sharma, who was like the, the COP26 president, he was an um, MP from Reading in the UK, um, and like how it transformed him, like the interactions with youth activists, with indigenous communities, like how it kind of really got like the climate change under his skin, as she said it, like, you know, like it really kind of made it so much more real for him and he became so much more like of a really climate warrior um, through these interactions with those activists. So it is just anecdotal because it's like an interview we had like, you know, with someone from a high senior level uh, of, of the team. Nevertheless, we don't really, we haven't really talked to, to the negotiators, so we don't really know exactly. But you know, there is some uh, there is some indication that it also, of course, influences them. And of course, they cannot ignore what is happening in the public space. They cannot like just you know do do their own uh, negotiations and ignoring what you know like how people talk about them. The other thing that she said, for instance, like you know, is they're quite intellectual because they are the photo. So like if the media, of course, you know, do do don't have equally any access to the negotiators. So what they see is as well like you know what is happening around like you know the cops. And so if they if the activists say, well, this is a failure, you know, this is like complete rubbish what you've, you what you've done in this and negotiated is a failure no matter what they negotiated and no matter what stands in the document and so in, in a way that's also quite a big influence she said and that's why the negotiators do respond to that they have to quick follow-up on that so, so the norm change we're talking about here is more specific about what happens so say at <coughs> the cop or something like that but uh, are you looking or planning to look a little bit how this might affect voting behavior yeah because that would be quite yes. interesting uh, and as you m might know, we had a rather interesting election in Sweden where you see a big swing to the right among young people. Greta's contemporaries mm. are swinging to the right and supporting party to are either denying climate change or, uh, or a bit lukewarm about it. So, yeah. one especially in actually uh, among young men, I should point that out too. Yeah. So, so one wonders whether this really has. And I guess you had this what, what was it called anti entrepreneurs. Anti entrepreneurs. Yeah. yeah, that's that's what we see. I mean. You know, you see an increase in, in those normative things. You see immediately an increase in the backlash against it. And of course, um, those um, entrepreneurs have a lot of resources. They're quite often backed by fossil fuel industry. Like, you know, there's a whole kind of industry around kind of spreading denial and delayed discourses. <coughs> and yes, so we... Um, sorry about So we're going we're gonna to look into this as well, kind of more closely, kind of more... Uh, more yeah, more at the national level, you know, like what kind of, you know, what is happening, like, you know, what, how, how, how the dynamics play out between the no norm entrepreneurs, the norm entrepreneurs, how does it affect political makers, but also how does it affect people and how they make decisions. We want to also know, like, you know, how those normative messages would affect people's behavior. So, yes, this is also part of the larger research that we're doing. It's not in this paper specifically, but, yeah, we're looking into this as well. Maybe you want to answer because I'm answering all the <laughs> questions. Right. I, I'll let you now answer. <laughs> Don't worry. Nino <laughs> Svedin, Stockholm Resilience Center. Uh, very nice, very interesting. And then comes the follow-up uh, discussion on the dynamics and the forces. Let's say that this is an uh, arena with different uh, types of uh, forces, like weather or something. Mm. Uh, something is happening. And then the question comes in this causality type of leaning of interest. Uh, what is happening? And uh, to my listening, I uh, listen to uh, one part that has similarity as a sort of clustering type of force, uh, which means that uh, things that are uh, close by, uh, they connect. The other one would be an actor, uh, and you are leaning to that in, in your design, an actor type of force, um, sort of uh, people actors uh, using the arena and pushing their topics. And it could be 
uh, promotional topics or it could be anti-promotional, like, let's say, the fossil uh, energy uh, actors, uh, industrial actors. And so what of these two types, the closeness type of which would be a sort of internal dynamics of the topics type of drives, force, and the others being sort of injected by using or counter forcing. Uh, that would be interesting to listen to, to a comment on that. You have touched on it, but it was a, sort of a descriptive part of how, uh, how is this uh, machinery looking. And there are also uh, things that are not appearing. So you, there is a surprise. Uh, I'm thinking about the limits to growth and the population side. Mm. There is no one entry of these on a population. And then you could ask yourself, why is it so? Is it really dead? Or is it just uh, sleeping? Or uh, what is happening? And that was just an example. Yeah. You want to answer that? Um, yeah, so uh, thank you for the question. I think it's um, a really interesting thing between yeah, the similarity and also the actors. Now, with the social network analysis, when we're looking at the different actors, it's kind of who is naturally occurring and who is naturally kind of crossing as many paths and being able to kind of interact with as many people as possible. Now, those aren't always going to be people who have the same normative values or trying to push the same normative agenda as what the, the fight is for future, for example. So we do see kind of um, more, I, I don't want to say neutral because it's still within the climate change um, kind of sphere, but um, kind of more like UN um, uh, accounts and things like that, which aren't specifically pushing a particular normative value. It's more of kind of an uh, ex explanation or kind of neutral um, uh, topic space. So occasionally we will see things like 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 that within the within the topic space. But the reason why we wanted to try and understand who the actors were and who the key messages is also to provide this information to the youth activists that we work with. So we work with some youth activists, for example, in the UK, who can kind of use this information, to see which are the main actors and how they're actually interacting with the with the topic space and with the discussion. And then they have a better understanding of either who that they can reach out to to kind of further their normative um, values that they want to push through or the, the the types of communication that they can use to actually kind of reach that topic space so that their message kind of diffuses um, among as many people as possible. So at this stage, it's not really trying to understand, it's, it's not really um, specifically saying, oh, if you target these people, then you'll be able to kind of uh, spread your message um, to, to everybody or these particular people are central to the discussion and therefore they are pushing a particular message. It's just more of trying to understand how they are actually interacting with the normative discussions at the forefront because like we mentioned, we're kind of in that, uh, the three stages of, of normative change. We're kind of in between the first and second in a way where we're talking about normative, the norm entrepreneurs, like the social movements are kind of pushing and we're trying to get to that kind of tipping point. So it's as we're trying to get to this area, it's trying to figure out, okay, who are the main players and what can we kind of really do with this? And then in terms of the similarities, um, are you refer referencing the Jensen Shannon kind of distance? Uh, I was referencing to closeness in a sort of causal sense, sort of small islands which would be on, on the actor side, mm -hmm. but uh, the drivers being sort of that uh, there is a, a sea level rise. So the sea level rise would be a sort of content oriented and the other one would be actor oriented. Yeah, I see what you mean. So within the topics that we extracted, um, there were many to do with sort of in, in your example, for example, like oceans and um, forests and uh, shipping and things like this. So there were lots of other topics, especially within those hierarchical clustering, um, so, so the circle packing images. So sometimes um, the topic around small island developing states, there'll also be other topics to do with things that are a bit more relevant to, to that kind of um, uh, discussion space. So um, forests or logging or deforestation, um, oceans, things like that. But we, when we were trying to pick out which ones were actually normative, we just um, focused on the actual small line developing states because that's what people were talking about in terms of we need to protect 
these um, vulnerable people, we need to protect the indigenous communities. It's kind of, um, you know, focusing on countries and focusing on people who are most affected by uh, climate change, regardless of sort of the specific reasons, if that makes, if, if that's clear. So regardless of whether it's because of sea level rises or because of deforestation, they're still the most uh, vulnerable. So those are the ones that we use as normative topics, but it doesn't mean that it was kind of um, uh, distinct from the actual kind of, uh, how should I say, circumstances around those particular topics. It's just that we didn't particularly highlight it within within this research. So the supplement material yeah. we actually look more and to like you know just kind of uh, hierarchical uh, topics and how they're connected. So which topics appear together within like the same kind of um, topic space and how they're responding or, or interacting with each other. So sometimes you know you would have normative topics that appear in specific relations to non-normative topics, but of course are strongly linked. So for instance, like you no know, ocean rising linked to s uh, to, the, to the small island uh, development states and how they're affected. So um, in the supplement material we look more close into this. There's only so much we could. Explain explain here about like it's very rich the data and like there's the very rich um, results and there's only so much space <laughs> we can have here to discuss this but yeah but yeah you, you're right I mean this is like you know we do look into this as well but more kind of in the supplement material which is even longer than the paper <laughs> are you happy with Adina? yes you didn't get an happy answer on with, your with the work very interesting oh, what about More the to come. The population question. Did you get? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I so didn't mm. uh, because yeah. it was outside the time range. Mm -hmm. I mean, you started uh, with the cops, yeah. and uh, then I took as an example something yeah. uh, two decades before, yeah. and sort of the time flow mm -hmm. of the argumentation. Yeah. Uh, so y you didn't touch on that because you kept your mm -hmm. uh, uh, realm of of argumentation over a decade or so one and a half decade, but. It was a counter example for long term yeah. flows. Mm. So yes. A little sort of yeah. inviting for yeah. broadening mm -hmm. the, the frame. Yeah. Now we actually, like, uh, when we yesterday talked uh, about, I mean, we didn't talk just specifically about that, like overall, the re over research project in Stockholm so Resilience Center, we were said, like, you know, we were actually pointed to the fact, you know, that maybe we can look like at a longer range time range and see like how this is, how does those different things have evolved, like how different arguments have evolved, like what kind of focus has been given to different kind of arguments and, you know, the kind of the population or like the, the limit to growth is of course has been a very strong kind of, um, like s a very strong kind of topical framework uh, in, in, in the 70s, 80s. And then kind of it, it kind of uh, became a bit less uh, of uh, 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 had less importance, but now it's kind of starting to reappear again, and we see we see the limits of like economic growth quite strongly actually referenced in the Fridays for Future discourse, not so much in the COP discourse. So the whole degrowth, uh, for instance, which is of course linking to the limits of growth in some ways, but more looking at it from an economic perspective, is quite strong actually within the Fridays for Future um, um, discourse, but not uh, uh, particularly later ones, where they, where they become very system critic, critically, um, but not so much in the COP discourses. Interesting. Uh, Pontus. You're going to get a mic. Thank you for this. My questions are similar to the ones that were just answered, but I still think there's a... So you looked l a lot at the influencers and whether they were central to the normative debate. Did you look anything across COPs so that it are like the influencers mm -hmm. and harboring of the future of what will be the talks next time, or are they still too linked to the path? Where are they... Yeah. Yeah, it's actually quite interesting because if particularly if you if you look into more like the detailed data, um, so we have like you know we have uploaded like a whole table like with all the influencers and with which topics interact throughout the different cops, and you see like you know some actors rising in influence, falling down, rising again. So you c we did look a little bit across the cops and how this is changing, and which influencers become kind of more influential or less influential over time. And there is certainly like you know changes happening, like as new kind of actors become, like in the like when the Fridays for Future kind of ended this stage, right? I mean, they become quite strongly, quite quickly, very influential in a way in a way kind of maybe like you know making le others less kind of visible then right i mean or like you know they become less influential like in in relative terms of course so there is there's definitely a lot of dynamic going on and uh, and we have looked a little bit into that but again like you know there's and and one can probably look into it more even more into this like i guess like the question like we what kind of research question would you exactly answer with that i mean is it like that you would try to understand like who will be the future influencers is that what you would be interested in or N i was thinking in the other direction that okay. is uh, 
are the things the influencers talking about if, if the influencers are not talking about normative stuff is that mm -hmm. a sign that the next cop won't talk about normative stuff oh, okay i see uh, and you might be right because the way you're framing it it sounds like you think the movement picks the influencer mm -hmm. rather than the influencer are influencing the movement mm -hmm. yeah uh, okay. and you might be right that that's the more salient perspective if that's if that's the case if it's more that whatever people want to talk about chooses who gets to be an influencer rather than the influencers are affecting the discussion mm. that's an then interesting then point. they're poorly named yeah we should look maybe into this i mean yeah. uh, we haven't specifically uh, systematically looked into this but this might be something we should because our data would allow to do that so that would be interesting to look into this thank you good point very good then we have uh, karim Thank you. So I was interested about uh, your uh, um, the model you presented uh, early in the talk about uh, the different stages of uh, social movements and how they influence norms and how um, and uh, the final stage was the stage where norms become institutionalized and mm -hmm. become parts of laws and so on. Um, so I was thinking in in the case with climate change, it seems that uh, many countries. Um, adopted the climate change uh, policies and documents and, and so on. I mean, the Kyoto Protocol is very old. Uh, long before there were these uh, grassroots movements. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, how does that uh, influence the model when, when the kind of process was um, kind of, it started out as a much more technocratic, mm -hmm. top-down process. And now you have these emergent um, social movements. But how does that differ from previous uh, movements where, where it was only from the bottom up. Yeah, so because I mean, the, the social movements are pushing, of course, like, you know, looking at, so the, the previous legislation is all about looking at the climate change from, from the technocratic, like, you know, economics or technical kind of solution perspective, right? So, um, yes, there are those legislations, but they don't really address the climate justice perspective or, like, you know, like, you know, the whole kind of idea of, like, like how does it like make sure that we really kind of guarantee like you know our the future generations have like a livable planet to live in so for instance like you know the, the type of legislation legislation that is for instance pushed by the by the climate movement is something like ecocide law like you know where you will criminalize um destruction of ecosystems um making actually on par with like genocide and you know human rights um and and and, um, and um, um, crimes against the humanity. So basically becoming one of the Rome Statute um, um, legislation. And, uh, and Greta Thunberg, for instance, like, you know, she, um, when she kind of got this big prize, I don't know, one million something, she donated it to the Ecocide Foundation, who is all fighting for, um, for the Ecocide to be implemented as legislation. So they're looking, they're, they're pushing for the type of legislation that they would kind of, you know, that would result from that kind of normative framework of, of climate change would be very different from the type of legislation we see at the moment, which is much more technocratic and much more kind of oriented towards, you know, f you know economic kind of solutions, technical solutions. So it, it's, it's really kind of uh, criminalizing really kind of, you know, um, like planet destructive behavior mm -hmm. and practices, making them basically out outlaw uh, outlawing them in a way uh, and making them um, as, you know, uh, and making sure uh, and making clear that they're as as bad for the humanity as things like genocide and so on. Mm. So it's a different type of legislation that they would like to see. Um, just a follow up. So I, I'm uh, not not an expert at this, but uh, but it was my impression that at least the Kyoto Protocol had a lot of um, addressed uh, a lot of these issues about climate justice. And uh, I mean, it, doesn't the Kyoto Protocol explicitly make a distinction between the industrialized and the emerging economies? Yes, but it obviously. <laughs> we are not there, right? Like, I mean, like, you know, it, it, it yes, it, it did in, the, in that regards, it did because it kind of it didn't like you know really include any responsibilities on the on the developing countries. Of course, we are now because we still like using we didn't use the Kyoto Protocol to really make much progress on the kind of you know addressing climate change. So at this stage, we're at the, problem, at the point where we cannot exclude any more developing countries from their responsibility. Also, rather like you know the question is like you know so we as 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 the ones who were driving climate change in the first place, the rich countries need to basically put a lot of finance like in towards like developing countries so they can basically skip over the phase of you know uh, fossil fuel 
industry driving their development by like you know kind of basically trying to make sure like they can straight away establish you know like you know clean uh, you know energy production uh, mechanisms and so on and and helping them adapt ad adopting adapting to the climate change so yes I mean in that regard it was um, uh, but it but in a way like you know it was it was a very weak mechanism and obviously it didn't include us for instance you know like so it was it wasn't yeah ambitious enough mm. i guess well on that note join me and thank the speaker for this great talk thank you we have had a number of talks connecting to climate change now we're turning kind of a financial tone next talk november 9th is Martin O'Neill and Marcus Furendal, the new case for wage order funds. And November 16, we have Ilya Viktorov, the rise of collateral-based finance under state capitalism in Russia. You're very welcome.